Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. So after all the beautiful images this morning of southern climes, um, we're off to the far north of Scotland and further back in time. So today we're going to be focusing on the archaeology of Shetland. Shetland is the northernmost archipelago in the British Isles, located 80 kilometres northeast of Orkney and 320 kilometres west of Norway. Today we're going to be focusing specifically on the west mainland of Shetland. So the archaeology of Shetland can best be characterised not by individual sites, but by preserved prehistoric landscapes, with some of the finest examples of these being located on the West Mainland. <coughs> these landscapes comprise of extensive field and settlement systems with upstanding field walls, lynchets, houses, clearance and burial cairns. Now these remains are widely considered to date from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age and are preserved by the spread of blanket peat in Shetland and the lack of subsequent sort of intensive plough-based agriculture. Today, agriculture in Shetland is primarily um, pastoral sheep farming. So previous research has identified two principal types of settlement in, Shet in prehistoric Shetland. Homestead enclosures, which are comprised of a single house contained within a single enclosure, and multiple field systems composed of numerous irregularly shaped fields and possible multiple structures. Um, Paleo-environmental work in Shetland suggests that these sites function within a system of mixed agriculture with evidence for clearance, cultivation and grazing, as demonstrated by this pollen sequence here and um, from the infilled lock basin at Scord of Brewster. So as mentioned, the sites are believed to date from the Neolithic and Bronze Age based on the artifact assemblages, the radiocarbon dates, and the redating of earlier excavations. Um, a lot of sites in Shetland were excavated by Charles Calder in the 1950s and 60s before the advent of um, widespread radiocarbon dating. However, structures in Shetland are notoriously difficult to date due to the longevity of the art. Um, Architectural styles, such as these oval houses here, which continue from the Neolithic all the way into the Iron Age, and the artifact styles. This is also compounded by the burning of peat as fuel in Shetland, which limits the use and certainty of radiocarbon dating. Um, basically, you have to be very careful when radiocarbon dating peat, because what you can end up dating is the development of the peat and not the burning episode from the context that you're looking at. Um, and this has resulted in a number of these dates being rejected. So what we're left with is a very broad chronological framework for interpreting these sites as basically Neolithic slash Bronze Age, or often they're just referred to as prehistoric. And the implications of this sort of will become apparent as we start to discuss these sites throughout the presentation. So the investigation of the prehistoric landscapes on the West Mainland involved using high-resolution aerial photographs to map a 160 kilometre square area of the West Mainland. Now, once this was filtered to remove the historic and modern land use, a busy prehistoric landscape began to emerge with a variety of settlement forms, prehistoric structures, burial cairns, and burnt mounds. Now, within this distribution, it is important to acknowledge certain areas of bias. So as you can see, we have less sites in areas of thick blanket peat. Blanket peat in Shetland in some areas can be up to sort of two meters deep. So it's undoubtedly covering some of these earlier remains. And this peat starts to develop sort of in the middle Bronze Age onwards. So we're possibly losing quite a lot of our quite early settlement records. Modern settlement in Shetland is located <coughs> in the coastal areas. So again, we're losing a portion of this settlement record due to um, later developments. So the analysis of these individual sites allows for an exploration of subsistence, settlement, and resource use in the past. So one of the most distinctive forms of settlement surveyed in the area are these homestead enclosures, which are remarkably consistent in form, being of similar size and shape. The GIS analysis um, of these also shows a distinct preference for certain locations. They show a preference um, for gently sloping ground, usually at the base of slopes. Now the enclosures themselves have principally been explored as fields, 
within this system of mixed agriculture, with previous work constructing estimations of yield and grazing potential, which indicate really the limited potential of such a smallly enclosed area. Now, the concept of a field to define sort of one area of grazing or just for um, cultivation is actually a relatively modern concept. In many contexts, you don't need fields to constrain a crop or to constrain um, animals. So moving a bit more sort of beyond cultivation to think of these sites in, the, in their broader context, they're perhaps best understood as a means of defining the activity area surrounding the house. And these activities may have included the production of stone tools, areas of cultivation within the enclosure, and seasonally specific activities. We can think of things like lambing and perhaps the beginning of seedlings in these areas protected um, from sort of the climate and the wind conditions in Shetland by these dry stone boundaries that enclose them. So within this, homestead enclosures may have represented fixed and defined spaces within a landscape used more widely to graze, grow, and gather. Now here, the limitations of our broad understanding of chronology come into play. There are arguments that these sites, sort of in a unilinear style of progression, represent the simpler, earlier, initial phase of settlement in these contexts. However, there is excavated evidence to suggest that they're contemporary with these larger field systems perhaps representing complementary or competing settlement forms. And finally, it's worth acknowledging that these types of sites may not be chronologically distinct. As I said before, this oval house form continues all the way into the Iron Age, and a simple house with a singular enclosure may have been a useful settlement form throughout the history. And it's important to remember that the functional and societal role of enclosure within these contexts may have been very different. And this is the, some examples of the types of sites that and we're looking at. They're quite small and ephemeral. This one in the centre is <coughs> overlain by late activity. But you get a sense of their landscape setting at the base of slopes um, in the sort of valleys. Now, the relationship between these homestead enclosures and the larger field systems are unclear, but they do seem to represent distinct forms. Now, the previously broad classification of multiple field systems allows for numerous sites to be defined as such. However, the survey really showed that only a small number are closely comparable to what is defined as the archetypal site at Scourd of Brewster. So Scourd of Brewster was excavated in the 1970s um, by Alistair Whittle, and it remains the only extensively excavated sort of a regular field system in Shetland. And it produced um, a large suite of radiocarbon dates, which although are not unproblematic, do suggest um, significant occupation in the Neolithic and into um, the Bronze Age. The exploration of the landscape identified the central field system and further boundaries on the surrounding hillsides, which were interpreted to have been laid out from early on in the life of the settlement, forming an infield and outfield type system. So as stated, a limited number of sites are closely comparable, with the GIS analysis of these indicating a key preference in contrast to the homestead enclosures for a sloping ground on hillsides with south to southeasterly aspects, with the fields themselves extending along the contours, usually located halfway up the slope. Now there is evidence for cultivation of the white or activity in the wider area, in the form of these small clearance cairns, which usually occur below the settlement on the lower slopes, and these large linear boundaries which cross the landscape, seeming to extend from these field systems. Now, there are practical reasons for constructing your field systems on slopes. Being halfway up these slopes with south-facing <coughs> aspects may have been a means to maximize sunlight and extend the growing season in Shetland. When we're dealing with northern latitudes, as we move into autumn and winter, daylight hours are significantly reduced. So maximizing sunlight may have been an important factor um, in the cultivation of your crops. Um, the paleoenvironmental work suggests that the principal crop being grown in Shetland is barley, which has quite a short growing period, but it's quite resilient to a number of um, conditions. Irrigation may have also played an important um, factor in Shetland, 
hydrological modeling and mapping of the modern drainage ditches and the intensity in which you need to dig these ditches on the flat ground to maintain sort of dry ground indicate that perhaps control of water movement across these sites was important and would indicate why you wouldn't preferentially pick the low ground to build these types of field systems. At Skoda de Brewster, the fields themselves seem to have been constructed um, during a phase of increased soil erosion. So they may have acted as a means to control soil movement across your site. Now the cultivation of the wider area also allows us to explore themes that perhaps the fields of differing sizes within these field systems may have been used for specific purposes, such as the planting of seedlings, which then would have been planted out into the wider area, or again, these seasonally specific activities such as lambing which, or calving, which can be quite um, a dangerous <coughs> time for the animals involved and you want to make sure that you are maximizing and looking after your flock. Now again, with homestead enclosures, we can begin to think a bit more broadly about their purpose. And this comes back to the themes discussed in the initial um, presentation. These sites are believed to date from the Neolithic and Bronze Age, which is a period of change across Europe. And they may have acted as a means to negotiate tenure, access, and ownership in a changing world. Their position halfway up the hillsides increases their visibility across the landscape. The scale of these sites, in a number of ways, could be considered monumental. And this is interesting when considering in Shetland we don't have any ritual monumental structures such as the big stone circles that you would see um, from a similar time period in Orkney. The monumental structures we do have were excavated in the 50s and defined as Neolithic temples, but really they're probably best conceived of as um, sort of large gathering halls. And what to me this may indicate is that actually this display of production may have played an important societal role in Neolithic and Bronze Age Shetland. Now, the survey revealed a numerous um, other settlement forms ranging from unenclosed houses, hilltop enclosures, um, and far more extensive sites with possibilities of multiple phases of development. And again, chronology is an issue in relating how these sites relate to one another as what we may be looking at is sites with specific functions, hierarchy of settlement, or again, these chronologically distinct settlements that may have had changing meanings through time. Now, the interpretation of a number of these sites was influenced by the excavations in July 2016 and 2017 of this site at Tronishan, which is located between the mire of um, Tronishan and the lock of Brunetua in this kind of rise within this valley that gives it quite sort of commanding views across the surrounding area and down uh, to the coast. The excavation of the prehistoric house in the centre revealed a structure that was constructed in the Bronze Age with a significant phase of remodelling in the mid-first millennium AD, what we in Scotland would term the Pictish um, period. Excavations across the field walls and the secondary structure um, revealed that these additional fields off the main enclosure were actually also later additions, pointing at the development of this site um, through time. And importantly, the wider survey revealed that morphologically this site is not distinct. There are other examples that look very similar um, across the surveyed area. And this provides the opportunity to reconsider the much later reuse of these earlier prehistoric sites and the possibility that sites previously thought of as Neolithic Bronze Age actually relate to a much later period um, of land use. So its main influence has been reinterpreting some of these more extensive sites, um, which show sort of evidence for several phases of development, but perhaps do share some similarities um, with that site at Sword of Brewster with irregular fields up on the hillsides, suggesting that some aspects may originate in the same time period. Now this site here at Pine Hooland provides a really nice example of some of these complexities where we have field walls overlying um, earlier structures, and you can see shaded in grey coming through the middle here. 
Um, we have clusters of features, which is actually quite unusual within the Neolithic and Bronze Age landscapes of Shetland. What we normally have are singular, isolated houses spread out um, through the field system. And then we also have quite unique features, um, such as this mound-like structure with quite substantial banks surrounding it, which overlie clearance cairns. So we can clearly see that we have possibly multiple phases of development at this site. And this has been analysed previously, but what the intensity of occupation has always been argued to have been the result of earlier settlement. This site is so intensively occupied because it's the result of earlier Neolithic initial occupation. However, I would argue that given the reconsiderations of our excavations, that actually we should be considering the much later reuse of this site and um, that interaction in the landscape between how these later periods engage with, reuse and remodel these earlier settlements within their own um, settlement forms. It's interesting to note that these more extensive sites, the boundaries tend to extend onto the lower ground, down to the coast, areas which um, comparative settlement elsewhere is more highly occupied in these later periods, suggesting that these sort of locations may have been more favourable. Now the identification of these elements and the hypothesis of relater reuse need to be explored further through excavation, but do provide sort of exciting avenues for rethinking some of these landscapes in Shetland. So to conclude, at first glance, the landscapes in Shetland appear to conform to this image of Neolithic and Bronze Age life that in our mind's eye is really quite easy to imagine, where we have ordered settlements, fields for crops, um, protected from the wild. However, this in many respects is misleading, as the survey really highlighted just the sheer variety of settlement forms. Um, with the excavations throwing up further questions about the date of some of these sites and their much later reuse. In Shetland, these landscapes can perhaps no longer be seen as sort of these fossilised relics of prehistoric um, land use, but should be understood as dynamic palimpsest landscapes that are being changed and adapted um, through time. And this really continues right up into the modern period. This um, that you can see here is me in the bottom, sitting within one of these field systems. But the green area across the Loch of Kellister, this is actually a um, sort of historic crofting settlement that went out of use in the early 1900s. And it's interesting to note that it's located on the other side of the Loch from the prehistoric remains. But what they seem to do is use elements of the prehistoric landscape to build things such as um, these structures called planty crubs, which are um, sort of small, circular, dry stone, unroofed buildings that are used to grow kale seedlings um, all across Shetland, and you find them on the common um, ground. So even up to this modern period, we can see this more complex interplay between the prehistory, historic, and um, modern periods. So really, my final note is that the problems of dating in Shetland should really not detract from its astonishing potential to ask uh, detailed questions about life in prehistory, and I think we're only sort of scratching the surface um, of its potential so far. So thank you very much.